everyone, and welcome to the Tom Morgan Drum Studio. Um, today I'm going to talk some more about the famous Ted Reed syncopation book, which uh, is so useful uh, for practicing jazz and uh, independence and that kind of thing. So today I'm going to start uh, explaining how we can get to the place where we can begin to play like I was just playing, where I keep the ride pattern constant and the hi-hat constant, and I just kind of comp or complement or accompany between my bass drum and my left hand. Um, to just start out trying to do that from nothing is difficult, and, and so we can use the Ted Reed book to get us started, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So, turn to page 38, that's where uh, the exercises begin that are so useful for learning this kind of jazz independence. And uh, the simple thing is, first of all, of course, you want to get to where you can play really authentic sounding jazz time. Uh, just between the ride cymbal and the hi-hat and maybe the bass drum on all fours, uh, feathering the bass drum. And let me just say a little bit about that. Um, if, if you uh, listen to great jazz drummers, you don't hear this kind of sound. The bass drum obviously was way too loud in the balance, in the mix. And so what the great drummers did especially during the swing era, but even modern drummers do this, they did what we call feathering the bass drum. And that just means that the bass drum pedal, the beater of the bass drum, if this is the beater, is only this close to the head. And it's just adding a bottom to your sound. So I might even just end up kind of using my toes to play this stroke with the bass drum. Okay, let me try to demonstrate it uh, again. So here's the same idea, but feathering the bass drum. One, two, three, four. Okay, hopefully that comes out well in the video. Um, but it's really felt more than heard, and you really don't notice it until you stop playing it, and then it sounds like the bottom drops out, drops out of your sound, out of your time field. So you want to practice, you know, starting out really playing the right cymbal pattern with the right kind of accent, round two and four. <laughs> Notice how open my hand was, okay? I'm not clinching the stick, okay? I, I've done some uh, other videos talking about the ride pattern and everything. But anyway, um, you have to start, before you start trying to do independence, you have to really have a good foundational time feel. And let me just preface all of this by saying it's essential that you listen to the music. I can't stress that enough. If you're trying to learn how to play this out of a book or just from what I'm telling you here, it's not gonna be enough. You've got to listen to jazz music and listen to the great masters. Um, listen to Philly Joe Jones, listen to Jimmy Cobb, um, listen to Roy Haynes, listen to Tony Williams, and the list goes on and on. Um, but notice as you listen to them, how they balance the set. How loud is the ride cymbal compared to the bass drum, compared to the snare drum? Um, you know, you'll find that the ride cymbal tends to be the most prominent sound coming out of the set when you're playing jazz. So assuming that you have that cooking and you have that going, and you're wanting to say, you know, I'm tired of just not really being able to do much with my left hand, uh, then here's where you can start. And I drew a little thing here to help me 
uh, explain this. Um, of course, the ride pattern is written with the X's here on the bottom, and I'm showing how they're going to they're gonna line up with the triplets. And then I wrote out the first measure of page 38 in the Ted Reed book, and I show how the notes uh, that I'm going to be playing with my left hand out of the Ted Reed book line up with the ride cymbal pattern. So you can see here, both hands hit together. Here on this quarter note on the end of one, it's going to play by itself with the left hand. And then this hand, the right hand will play this note, and then the rest are all in unison, except that this last note is with the right hand alone. So if I look at the first measure, I'm going to just play it really slowly with just my hands. One, two, and three, and four, and... <laughs> Okay, so I'll just repeat the first measure a little bit so you get the idea. One, two, three, four. Okay, so... You, if you've never done this before, it might take you some time to work that all out until you really have the sense of when each limb or each hand is going to play. And, you know, you might have to write that out for several measures, maybe several lines, before and learn to play it before you learn how to do it or how it begins to start to come natural at that point. Um, so if I play the first four measures, or first four lines of page 38, just hands only, it'll sound like this. One, two, a one, two, three, four. Okay, so hopefully you could follow that if you have the book, got to have the book, and uh, see how I'm playing the left hand, using the left hand to play the Ted Reed exercise, and I'm keeping the right hand ride pattern constant. Now, if that's really hard for you, you know, if you've never done this before, don't despair. Uh, you can actually go back a few pages in the book to page 30. If you look on page 30, there's several exercises, several pages here, where you have one measure that's repeated for, uh, for three more times, four measure pattern of the same rhythm. So uh, these are a little bit easier, and so you can maybe work out some of these, like on the first one, the left hand plays one and two and three and four and. So um, all the quarter notes are, you know, except for the first beat, all the quarter notes are happening on two, three, and four. So that's going to sound like this, one and two and three and four and. <laughs> Okay, now if you look at line two, there's only one note different between line one and line two. Um, the and of two is added there, 
So now it's one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So it's not that hard. If you can do one, then it's an easy step to ruin line two. One, two, ready, go. And so you can work your way through all the pages like that, page 30, page 31, and page 32. Page 32 is kind of a summary of the other two, of page 30 and 31. It mixes all those rhythms up in different orders. But that's a little bit easier. Uh, we don't have quarter notes falling on the upbeat, on the and, until we get over to the, you know, further on. Um, when we get over to page 34, the same format is used there, four, me four measures of each rhythm, but now we have a little bit more complicated rhythms. So you can work your way and come at page 38 that way by starting on page 30 and just slowly working your way through. If that's too hard, if that's still kind of a big jump for you, and it, it very well could be for a lot of people, then you can really go back to almost the beginning of the book and start either on page uh, 10, which just has eighth notes and quarter notes, or I've had students that I go clear back to page eight and start with quarter notes, um, or before that, you know, uh, the very beginning of the book. Um, and so, you know, start where you have to start. If you have to start on page four, then start there. Just learn how to play quarter notes, one, two, three, four, on the snare drum while you're playing the ride pattern. One, two, three, four. Okay, so, uh, that's what you would do if you really need to go back and check that out and, and you know, work your way back through it. Don't, if, if 38 is just killing you and you just, you know, it's just too much for your brain to take in, don't beat your head against the wall. Go back further to, toward the beginning of the book and find a place where you can start to get it going. Um, once you start to get the concept, pretty soon your brain kind of figures out how to do it and you're able to move through it. Some of you will be able to just, you know, work out a few measures of page 38 and then pretty soon your brain is going to start, oh yeah, okay, that's how it works. Okay, so once you can do page 38 with the left hand, uh, with just the hands, but the left hand playing the feed book, then add the feet. So I'm going to add four on the bass drum, but very, very softly, and I'm going to add the hi-hat on two and four. So I'm going to have this like I just played a minute ago. One, two, three, four. Okay, and then now I'm going to add the left hand playing page 38 and have the feet added in with the symbol. So here's what the first four lines of 38 would sound like. One, two, a one, two, three, four. of exercises that are basically the same kinds of rhythms as this. So you want to work through all eight pages playing it that way with the left hand playing the rhythms and the ride pattern and feet 
playing their part of the swing pattern. Okay? If you run across a measure that kind of throws you, stop. Maybe slowly work it out, maybe write it out like I did so you can visually see how the notes line up. That's a very good way to do it, if you can, if you can do it that way. Um, but then play that measure slower and play it repetitively until it becomes natural. And then, you know, add it back in and play it again. The second measure of the second line is one that hangs a lot of people up because you have the tied eighth notes in the middle of the bar. So um, you're doing this, one, two, three, four. And the thing that makes it hard is you have to play together, um, together, together, together and then your right hand plays by itself. Okay, so that might hang you up. I've seen a lot of students get to that measure and you know they have problems with it at first. But again, if you slow it down and work on it, uh, you'll get it and then put it back in. All right, so um, that will keep you off the streets for quite a while, just practicing those eight pages with the left hand. Now, once you get that started and you can kind of do it, the next thing you want to do, and this will be the only other thing I cover in this video, um, is do the exact same thing, only this time you're going to leave out your left hand and you're going to play the Ted Reed book with your bass drum. And since it, it's sort of the soloistic concept uh, here, then you, uh, the bass drum is going to be the prominent, not the most prominent sound, but a more prominent sound. So you're going to play it a little louder than you would play it if you were fe uh, feathering the bass drum. So uh, again, you might go back and work on just playing the right foot and the right hand by itself. One, two, ready, go. Okay. And that, boy, does that ever build up your bass drum. It's one of the best exercises for developing just good bass drum technique because uh, you're forcing your foot to play exacting rhythms, intricate rhythms. And, the, and the, the thing that you have to understand is, of course, our feet are nowhere near as coordinated as our hands. And so, um, and it's only because your ankles are not used to making the kind of intricate motions that your wrists and fingers are. So um, it's not so much that you have to develop enough speed to be able to do this, but you have to develop the ability to put the note right where it's supposed to be. And that, can that takes coordination and control. So um, a byproduct of doing this is you, your bass drum will develop uh, more accuracy and more control. Okay, so now I'm gonna put the hi-hat in on two and four and keep my ride pattern. And I'll play the first four lines of 38 again. Just leave out the left hand. And uh, here we go. One, two, a uh, one, two, three, four. Just like you did with your left hand, you're going to play all eight pages with your bass drum. And it's going to take you some time, if you've never done this before, to, to practice those, both, those pages both ways um, 
But that's going to set you up for more fun later, uh, more ways of doing this. There are many different ways you can use this, uh, these eight pages to develop all kinds of techniques and they can apply to your jazz time, they can apply to even playing a bossa nova or a jazz samba as well. Um, but we won't get into that now. Um, so you also, one last thing, you may notice that I'm phrasing these rhythms in a jazz style. It's more than just playing the triplet style. I just sort of naturally tend to accent or emphasize certain beats over others, certain notes over others. And uh, it tends to, in general, be that I'm going to put a little more emphasis on the notes on the upbeat, on the ands. Not always. Sometimes when there's a string of eighth notes on down, or quarter notes on downbeats, I might accent them slightly more. How do I know how to do that? Because I've listened to jazz for many, many years, okay? There's no formula for it. I can't give you a principle that you can apply, except to say we tend to accent upbeats a little more than we do downbeats. But if you listen to great jazz drummers uh, and really focus in on how they phrase things, you'll begin to, and not only drummers, by the way, but just the way horn players uh, phrase their lines and where they put the accents in, you'll begin to just intuitively know, oh, you know, I mean, this is how this should sound. Um, nobody told me how to do it. I just listened so much that it's just, you know, there's just no other way to do it for me. I, I'm trying to sound like those people that I idolize and listen to, so, you know, it was my natural way of doing it. So, you know, keep listening. Make that a part of your practice period every day. Don't just practice, but practice for a while and then stop and put on some recordings and, and listen to some great jazz drummers. And then go back and practice some more. And alternate back and forth like that. You'll find you'll inspire yourself to keep practicing and, and trying new things. All right, so hopefully that's helpful to you. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe. Uh, it really helps if you subscribe. And please spread the word. If you know other drummers that might be interested in this, uh, tell them about this YouTube channel. All right, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.